In this video, we're going to think about ways to govern the ecological society. We'll start the conversation by thinking about bottom-up and top-down approaches. When we talk about bottom-up approaches, what we're really talking about are organizing the grassroots or getting everyday people to become mobilized, to take action. And when we looked at the environmental movement, that's sort of exactly what we were talking about. And that kind of solution can be effective. It's entirely driven by agency and is not necessarily structural. Uh, if it's successful, it can lead to structural changes. And in fact, I think that's what has happened. When we talk about top-down approaches or change from the change from above instead of from below, what we're talking about is governance. And governance can mean many different levels, the local, the state, and the national. And in fact, even something at the international level in the form of agreements and so forth exists. So how do we think about making changes from above? And these are structural changes rather than agency-based changes. Uh, and of course, when you change the structure, that's going to change the types of agency, types of decisions people can make, and therefore the types of agency that can be exercised. There are some who advocate primarily for bottom-up approaches for a number of good reasons. It's democratic, it's inclusive, it involves people. Uh, but there are problems with relying only on the bottom. Uh, in other words, not having some kind of structural component in the portfolio of our, our ways of solving problems. And so some of the problems include the difficulty involved with gathering the necessary resources. And by that we mean time and money. And expertise is also sometimes in short supply when we're just talking about everyday people. So we may need to find scientific experts, and a lot of times those work for government, and uh, not always, also universities. Uh, Bottom-up can also be divisive. Even though it has the potential to be democratic and inclusive, it can go a different way if it's not done well or done right and that can lead to divisions in the community and you know, there's not one local community in the world but many and so pluralism or this kind of diversity of values that people have can complicate the process and it can become difficult to draw boundaries around who is a relevant stakeholder and who is not and usually it's it's this part that breaks down and can lead to uh, problems and of course, if we were to rely solely on structural changes, sort of the top-down change model, uh, as was the case with the conservation movement of the early 20th century, for instance, we saw a number of problems there as well. Uh, by not involving the public, uh, there's not a whole lot of buy-in from the public. And uh, changes from the top can lead to foot dragging on the part of those at the bottom as a result. You know, If you don't really believe in the change that's taking place, why would you be motivated to participate in it? And uh, so this can also lead to a potential legitimation crisis where the public sort of uh, loses confidence and faith in the, in the governing structure. So what we're talking about largely is power, right? For the bottom to have power, it needs the top. And for the top to have power, it needs the bottom. So we're going to take a look at what each can contribute to the other. So when we refer to governance, we're referring to political power that's used to change the social structure of a society. And so that cannot be forced on anybody who's unwilling to accept it. Uh, usually if there's not public approval or acceptance of uh, whatever kind of structural changes, be it laws or policies that are enacted, uh, usually those tend to get reversed as the public uh, elects and votes in new members of the Congress or presidency and the next person will represent their views perhaps grassroots organization arises from when society exercises agency against social structure and oftentimes when governance is very top-down and not uh, inclusive or democratic it can actually mobilize people right as, as they kind of lose uh, the sense of legitimacy in the power structure Right, so that, that can result in governance that ultimately changes the social structure again, and that's something we saw with the civil rights movement as an example. 
So agency-based approaches, uh, you know, here we're talking about social movements in the context of the environment, of course, the environmental movement and all its different uh, varieties. But usually when we're talking about the bottom-up grassroots environmental movement, we're talking about the one from the 70s and then later on in the 90s as well, so the second or third waves. And to a large degree, this has relied on uh, attitude behavior kind of model where we try, try to change people's attitudes about the environment and we hope that as a result of that attitude change that they they will behave differently but the problem is and we have a lot of research on this this cognitive fix as Huberlein calls it has a lot of problems uh, there's a disjunction uh, between what people value and what they actually do <laughs> we're not always completely consistent in other words and oftentimes we actually adjust our behavior. Uh, we, well, hopefully we'll adjust our behavior to fit our beliefs. Sometimes we adjust our beliefs to fit our behavior. In other words, self-justification can come into play. So the main reason is the way our lives are socially organized. Uh, the way we don't always behave as uh, our attitudes would dictate because of the way social structures are organized. And those social structures can oftentimes severely limit our choices and our agency. Right, so this, uh, the creation of new constraining influences that shape and guide our lives can have a strong influence on our behavior, even uh, when it goes against our attitudes. So with structural approaches, uh, the goal is to create the kind of environmentalism you don't have to worry about. Uh, so we don't want to have to rely on cog cognition or attitude adjustments. We don't want to have to dig into people's value systems and so forth. What we want to do is create a social structure that functions in such a way that it is sustainable and people don't have to put a lot of thought into it. They just go about their daily lives. And so our lifestyles are then structured by what is uh, sustainable. Instead, what we have now is that what's cheap and convenient is not sustainable typically. And so we have created an arrangement, a social structural arrangement, that promotes very unsustainable behaviors. And the authors of uh, the textbook, uh, Bell and Ashwood, talk about virtual environmentalism, and this is really what we get when we build environmentalism into the social structure. So by investing in the infrastructure to support, say, bike lanes or other types of sustainable transportation, or we, we, we have forms of urban planning that promote walkability so we're relying less on automobile transportation and so this will depend as much on our social constructions as on our material constraints and possibilities and those social constructions you know what is a city what is nature what is sustainable those kind of questions need to be answered before we can start building this kind of virtual environmentalism and uh, a big part of it, the package, when we make structural changes, is considering some type of green economics in combination with some types of green politics. In a different presentation, we studied the treadmill of production and some of the problems with the way our economy is organized uh, in terms of promoting profit over environment or other social concerns in many cases. So the idea of green economics is that we're going to restructure the economy in such a way that it makes more profit sense it's more desirable to do the sustainable thing right so we're going to rearrange the treadmills in, in a new way so this will require us to become critical of market knows best arguments uh, typically the free market unregulated leads to monopolies uh, leads to profit seeking as to be expected that's the main rule of the game but oftentimes without regulations that profit seeking is very short-sighted and can lead to long-term problems that are actually unprofitable but unfortunately short-term decision makings uh, decision making tends to dominate the current economic arrangement so green economics would would adjust that to a more long-term view but one of the key things with creating a green economy is identifying all those externalities those things that are not built into the costs uh, of products and, and services that we have in our current econ in our current economy so this internalization of otherwise hidden externalities can lead to more realistic and honest pricing uh, that's that's one thing and the other thing we can do is we can generate green taxes now of course taxes are never very popular 
uh, with anyone, uh, you start hiking up the price of goods and services, and the public is generally very unhappy. And that's why we have not seen very many of these kinds of things be enacted. But the logic is, if we apply some kind of tax for those goods and services that are less sustainable, that people will choose to buy less of that. And they'll buy more of those products that are more sustainable because they won't have these green taxes. Uh, but as we said, this is problematic because the public does not always love the idea of being taxed. In fact, it's usually the opposite. Another key idea in the notion of green economics is treating industry as part of an ecological system. So the key idea here would be that pollution is a sign of inefficiency. And this is very consistent with the ecological modernization uh, logic. The notion that sustainability is actually profitability and uh, getting different companies to play by a new set of rules can help them to see that. And so uh, the idea is companies will make a product and they, they'll stand by that product from the beginning to the end. Uh, and some companies do currently accept the refuse or the waste byproducts, such as when you, you drive a car until it breaks down. Well, if a uh, car industry is following this model, they'll accept the broken down vehicle and they'll take the parts and they'll reuse them or recycle them and, and they'll make a new car. And that's a much more sustainable model. There are some scholars, such as uh, John Bellamy Foster, who contend that the problem is much deeper uh, and requires a total systemic shift from capitalism to something else. In the case of Foster, that's a move towards socialism, uh, because the argument is uh, capitalism requires infinite expansion of profits and resources, and the Earth, of course, has limited resources, so they're incompatible uh, systems, the economic system and our biophysical natural systems of the world. So uh, scholars like Foster want to see a shift to socialism because it's more uh, sensitive to human need. Uh, if you look at this quote from Marx, a famous quote, from each according to their means and to each according to their needs. Of course, the devil with the devil's in the details with this whole thing. Nobody's really sure what socialism is. <laughs> it's certainly not what happened in the Soviet Union, although that was the goal. Uh, but in any case, you know, the real critique of this, this kind of thinking is feasibility, practicality. When is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? And is it even productive to carry on this conversation if we can't answer any of those questions? Right, so that's part of the problem. Uh, but governing the ecological society will entail uh, more than just government working behind closed doors and figuring out uh, strategies to solve problems. It's going to require citizen involvement and indeed requires it. Uh, so the good model to think about is participatory governance. Uh, the idea that people have to be involved and they have to be part of the decision making. And in fact, uh, for instance, when the EPA was evaluating the feasibility of hydrofracking, they did uh, go out and hold a lot of public meetings and try to get input from from people in society. And uh, of course, in some states, they decided, no, it's not for us. And the government uh, respected that. The, the state actually has final say on those kinds of things. And the state of New York, for instance, uh, even grants that down to the local level so that each individual community can actually decide what they want to have happen. Uh, so this uh, other example of uh, supplying water to a Costa Rican village, uh, as you'll read in the textbook, involves local people acting as equal partners in the development project in order to ensure a shared sense of ownership of sentimental commitment to a project. Uh, so that's, you know, buy-in uh, is a big uh, bonus when you have participatory governance. Uh, if you have some kind of top-down government uh, dictatorship, for instance, where the people are not participating, they're not going to have any ownership or pride in whatever kind of results come about. And so with green politics, uh, when you involve the public in this kind of participatory governance structure, uh, what you're doing is you're acknowledging the value of local knowledge. 
And uh, say in the 1950s and 60s, that was not really the case. Uh, the idea then was that experts would go to less developed countries, impart their knowledge on local farmers, for instance, assuming they their their traditional farming methods were valueless, and that they should just adopt the the new technologies and ideas of modern science. And uh, in many cases, that happened, and in some cases, that was actually somewhat successful. But in other cases, uh, by disregarding local knowledge, the one-size-fits-all policies of the 50s and 60s failed several people, and the uh, result was often disaster in the form of lost crops, uh, the loss of soil fertility, deforestation, and so on. So the important idea with green politics is to throw that old model out and start giving credit to local farmers that maybe they know something about the land they farm. After all, many of them have been farming this land for, for decades, if not centuries. And allow farmers to devise for themselves uh, what kind of solutions are best right, to the, to the local ecological, economic, cultural, and agricultural circumstances. Right? Scientists can still be helpful, but the idea is that they'll be having conversations and acknowledging some of the value of, of the knowledge that those local farmers have. And finally, we can talk about environmental flows. Uh, we recognize our world as, as one fluid world. Uh, there are political boundaries, but they mean nothing when it comes to environmental concerns. Uh, so to do something in one place is probably also to do something in another. So even if one country passes a particular set of policies, it can still be impacted by another country that's upwind or upstream. Right? So we cannot govern entirely the outcomes. We cannot govern our daily lives by considering only the local or even the national level. So there needs to be some kind of combination of thinking here about the global level, the local level, and, and different levels in between, and, and also what we can do as individuals. Since discussions of environmental governance or governance in general typically bring to mind notions of the federal government or the national government, national laws and policies, I like to stop and reflect on what can happen at the community level and uh, give a little consideration to why community level action could actually be superior in some ways. Uh, so community, what do we mean by that? Well, we mean it in the widest sense as we have throughout uh, many of our, our discussions and presentations from the beginning. Community is not just people, it's the environment, it's all the other inhabitants of the environment, the non-human animals, the non-living things. And we have a few principles to think about as we start considering ways for community action to proceed best. And those are sustainability, as we've, we've talked about in other places, environmental justice, right, and the rights and beauty of nature. So an important question to ask here is, why the community? Why would we want to take action at the community level? And the argument for it is that communities are immediately available. Uh, you, you can go out and do things in your community and make even significant changes in a short period of time because you are part of the flow of that community uh, by interacting with other members of the community. And you have closer access to officials, uh, elected or appointed officials who work for, say, your local government or your county government, and are very close within reach. And uh, so individuals can, can mobilize at the local level, and they can apply a lot of pressure to their local uh, officials to make new policies, make changes in zoning, for instance, and those kinds of things. So the individuals are the agents of community change and uh, as much as communities are the agents of individual change. So the thing is about federal changes or global level changes is they often seem too big and can actually kind of discourage people trying to make those levels of changes. So instead of sitting around and waiting for the top to act, why not do something at the local level? Why community? Because individuals have more power locally than they do at the state or national level. They have more say and more political influence. And we're more likely to regard uh, the environment, the local environment, in a more locally appropriate way when community life is organized and to, to think about such things. 
So in a lot of ways, the community can act as a go-between uh, between the individual and the larger society, right? It, Wilkinson makes this case in his theory of the community field, uh, where he says uh, individuals can really only influence structure at the local level, in fact. Uh, he, he says they have very, very little to no influence at all at higher levels because society is just an abstraction, whereas community is an actual thing that we participate in. Uh, communities, however, can exert vertical influence. So your community, uh, that is your local officials, the, the municipal uh, elected officials can, in fact, have some stay at the state level or even at the federal level. And, of course, the state can have influence at the federal level as well, or the national level. Uh, so communities can exert horizontal influence on each other uh, as well, that is, mayors talking to each other or city councils talking to each other and different partnerships or alliances can form and resources and expertise can be pooled and so we're not just limited by the the, the size of our community and that is a big advantage uh, there's also community development sometimes this is something that's built into local governance and sometimes it's sort of independent but the idea is uh, in community development an expert of some kind is hired to facilitate, to act as an expert, or to help organize people to create changes. And there's three basic models for doing that. Uh, the first is the technical assistance approach, where experts are are, dis, are identified, uh, community development specialists, who will diagnose and solve the problems of a community without much uh, community participation in that. The self-help approach uh, involves the community in a lot of different ways and is more focused on the process of development than on the outcomes. And conflict is an approach used in community development when there's a high level of social inequality in the community uh, in order to sort of level the playing field before any other action could be taken. So those are the three main approaches, and of course we could actually spend an entire semester talking about those. And in fact, a course on community development is a, is a great idea, it's a, a kind of complement to this discussion. But the competing ideas here, uh, when we look at solving things from the, the grassroots level or from above the governance, social structural solutions, is a competition between a conflict approach in general, not just as a community development approach, and the consensus approach, right, which is used in the self-help approach in community development. So the, the question is, you know, how is power already arranged? And uh, again, if we have high levels of inequality, we have some powerful elite, maybe, that's calling all the shots and making top-down decisions. Uh, you know, that's one thing. And if we have a situation where power is more equitably shared across uh, people, well, that's another. And, and so the current arrangement of power is going to dictate the best way to move forward with making solutions. We also need to take a look at structural conditions. Um, the best approach for community development is going to depend on what kind of structural conditions we've got. So if we have a power elite, uh, as we mentioned through the conflict kind of model, would be more useful. And if we have a more pluralist, uh, widespread distribution of political power, then self-help is more appropriate. Generally speaking, uh, technical assistance will complement one of those other two. It usually does not work very well on its own. Uh, but when we do have emergency situations, uh, time is very short and things need to happen. Maybe a community is facing uh, some kind of natural disaster. Well, then technical assistance may be the best choice. But what research has found and practical experience in the field has found is that depending too heavily on experts, as in the case of the technical assistance approach, can be dangerous uh, because it's non-democratic and if you allow experts to rule your community you're just creating a technocracy so what they view as risky gets imposed on the community and the community has little input over what types of risks it's willing to take finally we need to think about the political opportunity structure and here uh, the key ideas are openness you know and that has to do with uh, it's the decision makers in a community are they willing to hear the concerns of the public? You know, so if if they're open, that's a good thing. And if they're closed off, that, you know, that re might require some kind of conflict approach to resolve that. Uh, and then there's implementation concerns. Uh, decision makers can do something 
about the concerns that the public raises. That's what that means. Uh, and then there's a structure of alliances. So that means decision makers must have the freedom to act. And it's, for example, some states really limit what local governments can do, while other states, as I mentioned, New York, for example, really empowers local governments to have a great deal of autonomy. And so finally, st stability is another key characteristic. And uh, that's going to that's gonna be related to all three of the other criteria, openness, implementation, and structure of alliances. And so that's basically it. We're, we just took a quick little look here at how we govern the ecological uh, society. And in fact, we ended up by thinking about governing the ecological community in the widest sense. Thank you for watching.